Hey, free to play gang, welcome back to another video. So we are going to split this video into a couple of sections. So the first section would be for legendary espers. The second section would be for the epic and rare espers uh, pertaining to their divinate. So we're going to take a little bit, we're going to explore a little bit more about the new divinate system and whether some of these are a little bit too overtuned or are they maybe not impressive enough? Because there are some cases where I feel like the Divinate kind of sucks a bit. For example, Unas, right? We will take a look at what he's capable of in just a little bit. So before we get into that, let me just explain how the process is going to work. So I'm going to show you the Divinate here. I'm actually just going to go straight into the level 6 because what you'll notice is that level 1, level 2, level 3, like I explained in the previous video, is just an upgrade of the stats itself, the maximum stats and the effect right the ability of this tier 3 divinate so the ability actually increases in efficacy or in terms of power so in this case the final damage just goes up but from 4 5 6 onwards it's just base stats that gets increased so i can effectively just jump for the most part all the way to level 6 or maybe even level 3 just to get a better idea of what the divinate is potentially capable of but do take note that this format is going to apply to every single one of legendary espers so as long as the equipment is at D3, then you effectively have the best version of the Divinate. So without further ado, let's start off with Dona. So at the start of a round, the bearer gains Conductor for one turn. And if the bearer's defense is above the targets, explosions in the sky's final damage plus 25%. So this is not bad. So at the start, he will begin, right? Any fight, he will begin with a Conductor for one turn, which is amazing. So if you have him at R6, which I do, when his Conductor is at 5 stacks, he instantly gain a turn. So this is really, really nice for his kit. Now, moving on to Jin Yu Yao, let's skip to level 3. At the start of a round, the bearer has a 50% chance of gaining speed up for one turn. This is really bad. Uh, okay, I wouldn't say it's really bad, but it kind of sucks because there is a 50% chance that this will not happen which means it's completely wasted. So you kind of have to plan for both scenarios, whether you have the buff or you do not have the buff. That is going to change the way Jin Yao is effective or not in your current team. Like for example, in PvP, right? You kind of want to have 100%. I think 50% is kind of weird. And uh, next we have Tia here. At the end of a turn, the bearer has a 50% chance of gaining recovery for one turn. It's like, like what's the point? Like, this, she's a controller, right? So what is the whole point of this at all? I have no idea. So some of these... They are kind of weird. I feel like they are, for the most part, placeholders and they are going to be improved over time, but I cannot be too sure. So now we have Yunchuan here. At the start of a round, the bearer has 100% chance of gaining speed up for one turn. So this is only at the start of a fight. So that's what at the start of a round means, okay? At the beginning of a fight, not at the start of his turns. That is a different thing. So he's gonna... This is what I mean. 100% chance of gaining speed up for one turn. This is so much better than Jin Yu Yao, which is essentially just worse, right? So for Jin Yao, it's just a 50% chance of getting speed up for one turn. Like, I, I don't understand why Yun Chuan has it just so much better, so much more consistent. I guess the developers really like Yun Chuan, which is why he's an R2 as well. Okay, then moving on to Louis, we have when the target's crit rate is below the barriers, rich avatar's final damage plus 30%. So I think this is pretty good, but I'm not super sure what happens when the, when the enemy has 100% crit rate as well. So equal crit rate, will we still have the increased final damage by 30%? But anyway, this is still pretty good and it's really good for his R6 effect. So he has one of the better, in my opinion, right? One of the better divinates. Next, we have Tangshen here. And when the bearer's HP is above 70%, which is himself, Righteous Anger's damage plus 30%. Righteous Anger should be his first skill. Yeah, it is his first skill. So his first skill actually has its damage increased by 30%, which I think is, it's not bad. It's okay. At least this makes his second skill a little bit more useful because this is how he can replenish his own HP. And I kind of hated his second skill because it only single hits. But I guess now there's a bigger reason for you to even use your second skill just to upkeep his HP. Not that you couldn't do it with like a, a nether set in the first place, right? But let's move on with Raven. So before casting Sunset, which is her second skill, right? Yeah, her second skill. The bearer has a 100% chance of gaining attack up for one turn. This is really good. Really good. Before casting Sunset though, so does that include Pursuits? So before you Pursuit, you gain an attack up buff because if that's the case, this is a really good buff for her. Very, very powerful. And next we have Nama. So at the start of a round, the bearer has a 100% chance of gaining attack up for two turns. So like I said, there are just some divinates that are just much better than other divinates. So we just had a look at Raven and Nama is just strictly better because he has two turns of attack up buff. Raven only has one turn of attack up buff. I think it's related to balancing. Although I don't really see the point of why Nama needs to have an attack up buff for two turns because he's already going to double nuke unless... Okay, maybe it's because of the passive where he actually loses one stack of his, his attack buff or something. I think. I'm not super sure. But at the end of the day, you're always going to be running normal with an attack buffer. But I guess right now you don't. Maybe. 
So next we have Liling here before casting Alta, which is his third skill. The barrel has a 100% chance of gaining attack up for two turns. Very si uh, similar to normal, exactly the same as normal actually. And Tricky, when casting Green Flames, which is his first skill, 100% chance of inflicting speed down on targets for two turns. This is very good. It's a very it's very good for his first skill. So now not only can you inflict stun, can you uh, return debuffs, all that kind of stuff. You can also inflict slow, which is what his third skill has. Uh, I think at like R2 or something like that. So this is very powerful for him because he is after all a controller. So that works really nicely. And now we have Hyde. When casting Underworld Curse, the bearer has a 100% chance of gaining Breath of the Deep for one turn. So Breath of the Deep is essentially just his passive. So if he uses his, uh, his oh, it's actually his first skill. So if he uses his first skill, he will always at least get one stack of Breath of the Deep, which I think is okay. So when you Avatar proc, you're instantly going to be able to revive, right? If let's say you had zero stacks to begin with. So yeah, very nice for him. And of course, the extra stats is amazing for heights. Now next, we have Gaius. And when in God King mode, the bearer's crit damage plus 25% for the first turn. Okay, so essentially his first nuke is going to hit much harder, which is, that's not bad. I mean, his level one is like plus 10%, which is okay. So I guess getting one copy of this is actually kind of nice. It's, it's, it's fine, it's fine, yeah. And next we have Bion Dina here. Oh, wow. God damn! Who knew she looked good out of the water, right? Okay, when casting Tidal Wave, if the target is not... Oh, but I read this as not bullied. <laughs> if the target is not buffed, 50% chance of performing a pursuit attack with Tidal Wave triggers once per turn. So this is kind of nuts, right? So Tidal Wave is her first skill. When casting her first skill, if the target is not buffed because she already strips the buffs with her passive, 50% chance of then performing a pursuit attack with the first skill itself triggers once per turn. This is actually really good. So she can double hit with her first skill, which is really nice. Then next we have Gabrielle, so when casting Broadside, the barrier has 100% chance of gaining attack up for one turn. This is so useless for her. So Gabrielle, I mean, you can view her as a DPS, but you don't need an attack up buff for her, right? She scales a lot with speed, and I mean, the attack up buff is, is definitely going to help her with her DPS output, but there must be something better that she could get and not an attack up buff. I feel like that is so... that's so bad. That's, that's just not good for her in general. Because you have to build her as an offense in order for that to make sense. It's just like, ah... Uh, Maybe because her base form is really so broken, I don't know. Okay, so Sally, after casting Ode to Joy, selects three random allied units and dispels one debuff from each of them. So three random allied units. And Ode to Joy is her third skill here, right? So when she gains Sweet Harvest, she would also dispel debuffs, which I think it's it's fine, but it's random, right? So I'm not sure what the priority looks like. Maybe if we can test it out, then that, that'll be good. Now for Oli, before casting Law of Duat, his third skill, the bearer has a 100% chance of gaining attack up for two turns. This is really good for his kit, especially in PvP. He's gonna gain a lot more offensive power on this skill, and I think it should affect his passive as well, because his passive will allow him to cast Law of Duat. So I guess that is a really, really good dividend for him. And now, Unas. So I talked about Unas, right? The reason why I don't like this is because at the end of the Barrier's turn, 100% chance of granting one random ally speed up for one turn. So your Unas is most likely gonna start first, which means one of your random allies, they are going to gain a speed up. Now, why this is a problem is because this completely throws your synergy off, right? So for example, if you wanted this Esper to move before another Esper, you could have the situation where that is completely swapped. So the slower Esper is moving faster right now, and therefore that completely breaks your formation. And this is quite important, especially in content like Desolt Lands, where you need certain Espers to always be ahead of other Espers, but this might potentially throw off your consistency, which makes him rather inconsistent. So I don't really like it so much. Now, on the other hand, let's take a look at Lucas. He is much better than Una. So after casting Pillar of Light, the bearer has a 100% chance of getting speed up for two turns. Yes, this is good. This gives himself the speed up buff for two turns as well. Pillar of Light is, I think, his third skill. Yes. He gains a speed up buff for two turns, which is a guaranteed effect. And I like guaranteed effects. I like consistency. So Una's is... Not that good. I don't think he's really that good. And next we have Feng Nusi story time. Okay, so at the start of a round, grants defense up to two random allied units, excluding the bearer for two turns. So again, another random mechanic. Now this is not as bad because this is not going to affect any turn order. So her effect here, her dividend effect here is still okay. Defense up for two random allied units for two turns is still fine. Wait a minute. What's up with all these long body aspers who just have a, a much nicer human form? <laughs> I don't understand. All right, next up we have Clara here. After casting Queen's Blessing or Hymn of Life, 100% chance of dispelling one debuff from the ally with the lowest HP percentage. So essentially, she just has an extra cleanse on top of her whatever effect that she has here, right? So her first skill is Queen's Blessing and her third skill is Hymn of Life. So when she casts any of her skills, essentially, she would also dispel one debuff from the ally with the lowest HP percentage, which I think is okay. 
Next, we have Cecilia. So at the start of the bearer's turn, if they are incapacitated, basically stunned, 100% chance of dispelling one debuff from themselves, which is not bad. This is actually really good. So this kind of makes you want to build her a little bit faster so that she can take more turns and get your Espers out of stuns, which is also really nice. Next up, we have Sienna. And before casting Guardian Vine, ah, Guardian Vine is her first skill. Okay, so after casting her first skill, 100% chance of granting OF, this is supposed to be like only fans, granting defense up to one random ally for two turns. Again, another random effect. I'm not super sure why this is the case, but it's kind of nice that she takes a lot of turns because she gains a lot of AP, so she's able to spam her first skill quite often, so that mitigates a little bit of the RNG, I think. Okay, next up we have Teva, and at the start of a round, the bearer's crit damage plus 25%, so same as Gaius, which is really, really strong, really powerful. Now next we have Ahmed, when open stage is on cooldown, which is his, when open stage, when world stage is on cooldown, which is his third skill here, prelude to life's healing plus 20%. This is insane, dude. His first skill's healing increases by 20%. This is a really, really good change. Uh, okay, I wouldn't say that it's like one of the better divinates, but it's definitely above average. Now next you have Jiang Tuli, this is gonna go crazy by the way. When entering demon mode, 100% chance of clicking stun on all enemies for one turn. Ignores resist, so it's always going to land unless you are immune, right? But this is insane. 100% chance of inflicting stun of all enemies on. That most this is probably gonna give him a new turn so that he can use his first skill of I mean so that he can use his defense ignoring attack with quite high of quite high certainty. Not sure what's wrong with me these few days, man. My stuttering is like increased tenfold. So yeah, Jiang Tuli, he has one of the better divinates. At least one of the more interesting ones, which is not a buff, it's an actual effect like a full stun, right? A new effect that is really beneficial to him. But moving on, we have Zora, never again. When the, when the bearer's HP is above 70%, Keen Age, final damage plus 25%. That is her first skill here, Keen Age. She has a lot of requirements to have above 50% HP and now she has a, a, another requirement that forces her to be above 70%. I don't really like this. I don't really like this. Even though it increases her DPS, but I don't really like the fact that she needs to have her HP kept up all the time. And then we have Elliot here, Tomes of Wisdom. When casting Pure Enlightenment, which is his third skill, the barrier has a 100% chance of gaining defense up for one turn. So essentially he taunts an enemy and he resets everything and he gains a defense up. I think that kind of works out for him, but I don't really like the fact that he lasts for one turn. I feel like this probably could have lasted longer. That's what she said. Next we have Brewster and when the barrier has reload attack, ha ha ha, his first skills, final damage plus 25. This is broken, dude. This is broken. This is one of the most broken divinates that I've seen thus far. So his first skill, which is whatever that he's pursuing with on his reload attack stacks, he's actually dealing 25% more damage, which is insane. The brawler set itself already made him so insane, and now he has an additional brawler over here, right, with a 25% final damage increase, which is nuts. This is nuts. Brewster is insane. And then we have Abigail. So when casting Thorny Brambles, 50% chance of granting an ally recovery for one turn. This thing should just be 100%. I'm not sure why there is a 50% here at all. I mean, you are currently at D3. It's a lot of investment. And there's only a 50% chance of granting one ally recovery for one turn. Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of nice that she has a recovery in her first skill right now. But I'm just saying, man, this should definitely be 100%. It's just a recovery buff. It's no big deal. Moving on, we have Everett, and when the bearer's HP is above 70%, Valkyrie's, Glory, Va Valkyrie's Glory's final damage plus 30%, so his third skill essentially does a lot more damage, which I think is kind of nice. It's just forcing you to build him more offensively than uh, maybe like more of a healer or that kind of stuff, right? So maybe the Panacea set would not really work out for him in most content if you have the Divinant at least. Okay, so now next, Incommunicable Ophelia, when the enemy's HP is below 100%, Elegant Strike, which is her first skill, Final damage plus 30%. So this skill is going to hit harder, which means her third skill is also naturally going to hit harder. Not the first hit, but the subsequent attacks. So I think this is not bad. This definitely works in favor of her design. And then we have Liora. When the bearer's HP is above 70%, Daylight Beam's final damage plus 20%. Uh, that is her third skill. Okay, so the damage of her third skill increases by 20%. And I'm not super sure because she has two hits, right? So does that mean that both her hits increase by 20%? This, I, I really don't know. But 20% is pretty good because she hits really hard and this makes her hit a lot harder, which I think is fine because her whole shtick is just about dealing a lot of like big DPS. Oh, and I think that would also allow Liora to completely smash the second wave of Kronos, which is perfect. So her D3 is actually a really welcome addition to her kit, I think. Okay, now a really, really good change here for Ashley. I mean, not change, but a divinate. So the bearer, bearer basically herself, has a 100% chance of getting one stack of Rainbow Bridge at the start of their turn. 
So whenever she takes a turn, she's instantly going to gain one more Rainbow Bridge, which is really good. Really, really good. But she's of course going to use it immediately because she already has 100% crit rate. So whenever she starts a turn, she will use that Rainbow Bridge stack, which will either reduce the AP of one enemy on Cloud Scatter or reduce uh, AoE AP and of course another AoE AP over here. So very nice. Now moving on to Ife, the Forgotten Child of this slide. So if the Barrier's HP is about 70%, 100% chance of inflicting poison for one turn before casting Gust, which is her first skill. No, not her first skill. What the heck, it's her second skill. So I mean, I guess it's fine because her second skill never had poison to begin with. So it's, it's, it's alright, it's alright. I think it's fine. Okay, next up we have the Phantom Sisters and when casting Heartbeam, which is her first skill, right? When casting her first skill, 100% chance of inflicting speed down for one turn. This is... It's like whatever. <laughs> then next you have Tang Ti. When casting Cosmos writing, 100% chance of granting crit up to two random allies for one turn. So when he casts his third skill, that's gonna happen. But what I hate about this is obviously it's randomness, right? You cannot predict which of your allies will get the crit up buff. And like I always say, it's very important that you have a consistent way to have 100% crit rate. So if you have less than 100% crit rate, you shouldn't rely on a crit rate lead. You should always rely on another alternative to get 100% crit rate. Be it your inbuilt way of gaining more crit rate for yourself, or having espers like Dahlia or Ethan by your side at all times so that you are always able to have 100% crit rate. This is not consistent and I don't really like this because if this goes to your supports or if this goes into another DPS esper that has already more than 70% crit rate then this is like kind of wasted so I don't really like this. I feel like there shouldn't be a randomness attached to all of these divinates because there is a lot of investment needed for it but I kind of get that you know Tang Ti is really so, so strong so his divinate if it's super consistent then it makes him even more insane. I guess. So next we have Elaine. When the barrier is under Night Goddess status, Oblivion Strike's damage plus 30%. Oblivion Strike would be her second skill. So the second skill is going to hit a little bit harder, which I think is completely pointless because her damage is not even that good to begin with. So the 30% might help, but I don't think it's going to be like game changing or anything for her kit. And next we have Intisa here. When the barrier is under Stealth, Trojan Horse final damage plus 30%, which is her second skill. Yeah, so her second skill is going to hit a bit harder whenever she's on Stealth, which is really nice because She's gonna spend most of her time under stealth status, but the problem with this is it's only her final damage and it's not the true damage portion that cannot be increased. So I think for the most part, if you're using her in Andrus, for example, the reason why she hits so hard is because of her true damage portion and not so much, uh, basically a true damage portion over here, and not so much because of her actual DPS, which is what's being scaled by the final damage portion here. So your true damage is not affected by final damage. Uh, don't ask me why, I've just played this game for a long time. Next up, we have Lian, a moment's rest. At the start of a round, the bearer has a 50% chance of granting two allies immunity for one turn. This sucks so much, dude. <laughs> It's like, okay, I mean, if you're R6, then you're yeah, sure, whatever, right? But can you imagine starting a PvP fight and you expect immunity and you don't get immunity? And the, the, the second layer is you get immunity, but you get immunity on the aspects that you don't really care too much about for having immunity. <laughs> Just like, what? I mean, okay, so the only way that I can see this to be really useful is if you already have the light set on all five of your espers. So at the start of the round, you instantly gain 10% AP because you instantly pop one of the light sets which, like I said, instantly grants you an additional 10% AP, but are you really going to build a whole team of light sets just so that you can gain 10% AP? I don't think that really makes a lot of sense. I think there are other sets that are much better than just having the light set on everyone. And now moving on, we have Mateo. So when the target has Spark, Fire Punches, final damage plus 25%. It's just the third skill here. That's it. More damage. Next up, we have Camille and Claw Attack has 100% chance of inflicting Bleed for two turns which is her first skill, which I think is okay. So the thing is about Camille's Divinet, you cannot actually get it from the Echo. She's actually free. So same as Dona, you can actually get them from the shops. And you know what? Let me just show you. So you notice in the shop, under the tournament shop, you can see that Dona's Divinet are actually obtainable here, which is how the, this is the only way that you can get his Divinet, which I think is actually not bad. I think he's, he has one of the better Divinets out there. And for Camille, you can get her via the cube shop which is a thousand of this currency per piece uh, times five, what, like whatever, I think it's like 50 per, per copy, I'm not super sure, but there is six stock over here for a total of 30 pieces. Maybe that is whatever that you need, you know, to obtain like a full copy of it. And as you can see, you can get Lucas Divinet Fragments here. So Dona, Camille, Lucas, you can get them for free. And you might be asking about Everett, right? Is Everett, <laughs> is, is, is Everett fusible? And the answer is actually no. So you cannot fuse Everett's Divinet. You can only get Everett's Divinet via the Echo itself. So I'm not sure why they missed out on him, man. And now next, as per we have Yuhime, believe it or not, I feel like she has probably one of the better Divinets out there. So the bearer has a 100% chance of gaining one stack of Hell's Hand at the start of their turn. So whenever she starts a turn, she will always have a Hell's Hand stack, which means if she has buffs, 
she will perpetuate all kinds of buffs forever without having to rely on landing debuffs or essentially just landing this beyond the grave skill onto enemies with debuffs and you don't have to worry about having like high accuracy and that kind of stuff. She's always going to have Hell's Hand whenever she starts a turn which I think is really huge for her kit. This is really really good. And now next we have Ethan and when casting Enchanting Song, 100% chance of grabbing defense up to two random allies for one turn. So like I said, randomness, I hate it so much. And now moving on to Embla, when the target is debuffed, Tethered Sword has a 100% chance of inflicting bleed for two turns. This really sucks. It really sucks. Like her bleeding damage is really bad. It's, it's not a mean thing. All right, next we have Relight My Fire, Yamato basically. So after casting Thunder Surge, which is his third, so his second skill. Okay, so after casting his second skill, gain six stacks of Rashomon. So the thing is, his second skill actually consumes Rashomon stacks. So he's going to gain it afterwards, right? So after casting it, he gains back six stacks of it. And after casting Death Grasp, has a 50% chance of reducing Thunder Surge cooldown by one turn which is really good. So this skill is actually becoming a little bit more spammable. And the good thing is he doesn't actually lose all his crit afterwards. So he still retains six copies of Rashomon stacks, which is 60% crit rate. So that means that his first skill is potentially going to be able to deal a little bit more damage. It's just a little bit more damage, but it's still nice that he has a way to retain his Rashomon stacks. And of course, at the same time, he has a 50% chance of reducing Thunder Surge cooldown, which is like, it's, it's not bad. I think he has one of the better uh, Divinets as well. Now next we have Shen Pin. So at the start of the Barrier's turn, 100% chance of granting one ally soldier, which I think is okay. I mean soldier, honestly, people don't really care too much about the chariot buff that is granted from soldier because it's just way too hard to stack soldier buffs. But I guess another way of applying more soldier stacks is it's kind of helpful. It's, it's not game breaking or anything like that. It's not gonna... She's definitely not gonna be one of those experts that you desperately need to chase for her Divinet. And now for Javid, <laughs> when the Barrier is not debuffed, Eternal Light's final damage plus 30% which is what his third skill and the thing is his damage output is not based on eternal light right it's based on judgment seal so i don't really see the point when the barrier is not debuffed then you deal more damage like that's so dumb that is just so dumb next we have genie so when the barrier gains chef's zest stir fry hits final damage plus 30 percent now chef's zest is essentially when you have three uh, intense heat stacks and then when you try to gain another intense heat stack you will instead gain Chef's Zest. And then her Stir Fry Hit, which is her third skill, right? The damage increases by a little bit. So this is really good if you have her at R6 especially so. Or you might need to stack a little bit more if you're below R6. Next up, Valyria. We're almost there, guys. So when the barrier speed is above the target, Launching Tide's final damage plus 30%. Launching Tide is her first skill. Okay, so this further pushes her first skill to deal even more damage because her passive itself already increases her basic abilities damage by 30%, right? Snake shape here. So her first skill actually increases damage by 60%. Wait, is it a final damage multiplier? It is a final damage multiplier, so scrap that. It's actually more than 60%. So her first skill actually has a lot of DPS output. It is not just 110%, it is way like 180% basically, right? So her first skill hits pretty, pretty damn hard before even considering the speed advantage that she has over here. Next, we have Hilda, Light of a New Day. So at the start of a round, the barrier has 100% chance of gaining defense up for one turn. Trash AF, useless skill, I think. Now next, Nora, Song of the Deep. After casting Halcyon Harmonic, the barrier has 100% chance of gaining attack up for one turn. I would say this is pretty decent because she's able to spam Halcyon Harmonic at R2 and above. I don't really feel like the attack up buff is gonna matter so much because her damage output is just not that great. So if you have tested Nora, you also realize that her damage output is is it's not much. I I yeah, I don't think the attack up buff actually matters at all. So it's kind of like below average in my opinion. And finally, we have Tolan here. When casting Point of Origin, his third skill, the barrier has 100% chance of extending the target's ability cooldowns to the max number of turns. This Divinate is insane. This is this is essentially just Elliot, right? So he is right now he is Elliot plus more. He's much better than Elliot. <laughs> This is nuts, dude. So right now, not only are you going to zero out the enemy, but you're also going to reset the cooldown. I mean, yes, when the enemy takes turns, right? When they, when they take active turns to get rid of zero hour, they will also slowly recover their cooldowns, which means this is not as powerful as it needs to be because Elliot is just like straight up, you know, full cooldown reset. But I mean, this is like unnecessary. This is way too broken in my opinion, right? It's unnecessary for his kid. So anyway, that's it for all the legendary experts. And this video was like super long. It took me 30 minutes of recording. And of course, what you're watching is just an edited version, which is a lot trimmed down. But I'm going to go through the rest of the epics and the rare experts in a separate video. Oh my god, man, this is going to be so much pain. But if any other questions, feel free to leave it down in the comment section below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And anyway, I hope you guys enjoy... Wait, what? Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this content. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's content. If you did, don't forget to thumbs up. It really helps the channel and subscribe for more dislike content. Now, that's it. This has been Derry Free to Play. And as always, I will see you in the next video.